Welcome to the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I am joined by Dr. Renee Morhan, founder of the Sojourner Truth Academy for Learning and CEO of Expanding Your Vision Consulting Group. Welcome to Black Doctors Talk podcast, Dr. Morhan. Well, thank you, Dr. Porter. I am so honored and excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. I would love for you to start out by telling our viewers and listeners a little bit about your background. Where does it all begin for you? Sure. Well, I guess there's no place better to start than at the beginning. Um, I was born in New York City um, and raised in Syracuse, New York. Um, And after that, I went to the nation's first HBCU, the Lincoln University, Chaney people, don't start nothing, won't be nothing. (laughs) And um, at Lincoln is where I got my foundation um, in education, a wonderful experience, Um, taught in a private school um, outside of Philadelphia in Chester, PA, anybody from that area, shout out to Chester. And um, I was there for about three years. And then um, I moved to Detroit. And that's where I have been spending most of my career with just a couple of times moving outside of the city to take jobs. But um, for the most part, been in Detroit for um, the the extended amount of time there. And I have um, started as an assistant daycare teacher and been everything. And when I say everything, just about everything from a kindergarten teacher to an instructional specialist, um, curriculum specialist, uh, assistant principal and principal. And I have enjoyed the journey. I love it. I love it. Our our backgrounds are very similar. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) So with almost 30 years of service as an educator, what do you see as the future of PK-12 education? Well, I must begin by saying there's a lot of work to do. Um, And if school reform efforts are going to kind of be our guide, we know that they have not served us well, specifically um, and primarily in the black and brown community. And so what I see needing to happen is what I like to call a lot of disruption in the way that things have been going. Um, I think that there has to be a whole revamping of the way things are being done. You see pockets of success. And I think that um, America has to do a better job of replicating those pockets of success. Because if you have For example, kids in the 90, 90, 90 areas where, you know, the 90% of poverty, 90% free lunch and all that. If they're finding ways in the backwoods of Mississippi to do that, we should be able to do that and more in urban uh, Detroit, Philadelphia and places like that. And so um, when we compare ourselves to other countries, um, I was looking at some research recently where we're like number 38 in math proficiency and we're just a few points above that in reading. And that's terrible because we know at one point we were number one and there's no reason why we shouldn't be, but it's almost like um, we're operating like a third world country when it comes to education. You know, there's a lot of things that look good when you talk about reform that um, looks good on paper, but when it comes to implementation and producing meaningful change, it's not happening. And so I say that there has to be some disruption in the way that we're currently doing it to see that meaningful change in our educational system. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Thank you for that. So who has been an influence for you in your professional career as an educator? Very good question. Um, I have to go back to my undergrad years. Um, The department chair of the education department, Dr. Judith Thomas, and the chair of the English department, um, Dr. Gladys Willis. I saw these as like two powerhouses, two black women who were excellent at what they did. Um, were very well known in their fields, and they just modeled excellence for me. Um, In addition to my mom, of course, always making sure that she set the standard at home um, before I went to college. And then, of course, the great Marva Collins, I have to say, she has been a major influence because of her um, trailblazing efforts to start the school in Chicago, because she had the mindset uh, that, you know, there has to be a better way to produce meaningful change for black and brown children. And I mean, she came in with a bang and she really did that. And so um, she has been a major influence to me. Thank you for that. Now research has shown that the top four factors that impact student achievement are teaching, teaching for learning, classroom management, home and parental involvement, and the belief that students can learn. Let's Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the importance of believing that our babies can achieve. 
What are your thoughts on that? Yes, um, believing in students, AKA high expectations, that is paramount, priority one. Uh, research shows over and over again that the teacher is the number one factor when it comes to impacting student achievement. Um, at the BDN conference recently, I shared some um, research about um, in America, most principals and teachers are white females. And there's research that also says that non-black teachers have the lowest expectations for black and brown students, which tells us that there is indeed a problem. And so if the majority of teachers have low expectations for our students, we know that that's a big part of us always being at the bottom. You know, if people don't expect us to achieve. And, you know, I just think that, you know, that's, that's a problem that is correctable. And it's all about, again, targeting resources. And it, go, it speaks to school leadership as well, that school leaders have to make sure that they're making sure that these teachers are ready to address the needs of all their students. Absolutely, because as you know, leadership is the second <laughs> thing that affects um, learning for students. Yes. So you are absolutely correct. So many school districts are on, undergoing big changes to improve the learning outcomes of students. You have experience in public and private and charter schools. What do you feel is the missing link to school reform? And I know this is the million dollar question. <laughs> I know. And, you know, there are people that will say a lot of different things. And for me, um, the main thing is um, equitable resources for me. There's some other things, you know, that are a part of what needs to happen. But the biggest thing is equitable resources. When you think about things like when I mentioned one school reform effort, a nation at risk, which identified what was wrong with our school system in America. One of the things they said in it, which is very basic, you know, a large amount of the money for schools comes from property taxes. And we know that that's never going to be equal if the housing in the city is, you know, cheaper than the housing in the suburbs. And it's, if you got an affluent suburb, you know, and, and evidence shows these, these districts outperform the inner city. And I don't think that is rocket science. And so for me, I think that um, we kind of beat a dead horse when we say, you know, what types of things can we do different? One of the biggest things is we have to have equitable resources. Thinking about where we are right now with the pandemic, um, I was talking to some colleagues of mine at schools that I've worked with in the past, and there are still students, you know, we're going into the second school year of the pandemic, still students that don't have technology. The schools don't have it for them. The schools don't have the money for it. Yeah, they're asking for donations. And this is something that should be a part of um, whether it's the government or whomever, what, depending upon what type of school you are. Um, these are basic things that students should have. So equitable resources definitely to me is the missing link. And you know, you are exactly right. Um, again, being a, a, an elementary principal, I see that firsthand. And um, it really speaks to then leadership trying to be creative when you yes. know, we don't have the resources. <laughs> So that our, you know, so that we can have that equal footing and, and have that equitable access. But it is, that is absolutely correct. And, yes. and I'm really glad that you spoke on that. Um, and, and yeah, so we really need to get a grapple on that. And hopefully um, with um, more than certain, we'll have a new secretary of education. Uh, we can see some changes um, for yes. our PK-12 education because it's certainly needed. It is, definitely. Yeah, good. So what do you feel is your mission in life? Another excellent question. Um, over the past few years, you know, just assessing some things, um, I really believe that my mission is to work with others to develop a blueprint for educating um, Black and Brown children successfully. Pre-K, well, actually daycare through 12th grade is the model that we're developing. And I believe that's what my mission is. I love that. And, and you know, I want to ask, because going back to the Sojourner Truth Academy for Learning, I'm yes. sure that mission was in mind. <laughs> it was. We founded that. And so <laughs> take a little moment now to talk about um, some of those goals that you have for um, the Sojourner Truth uh, Academy. Most for definitely. And um, someone pointed out to me, because I had done a Facebook post live when I was talking about starting the school and um, someone said it was like um, 
it was connecting the dots of my personal experience because I started out as an assistant daycare teacher and wound up, you know, going on through teaching high school, principal high school. And so it's like I've seen the full gamut of it and then feeding into the Afrocentric um, strategy. Um, which is basically, you know, when, when the baby comes out, it's this whole sense of the community wrapping around and making sure that you are inundated with the culture and the mores and the tradition so that you understand that you can be grounded and that, you know, you can have that confidence. And you think about some of the things that our students struggle with um, as opposed to other cultures uh, where they have a lot of traditions where I was thinking about the black culture outside of African culture. But when you think about it, we have some things that we do, like we have family reunions. We um, celebrate certain holidays, probably a little different than other cultures. But when it comes to those things that build that sense of pride, you know, when you think about, you know, those rites of passage programs and things that we'll have in our school, those are some of the things that we want to do. Having those things with the young ladies separate from the young men and just and just building in that sense of pride and that sense of, you know, knowing that you can achieve whatever you set out to do and not just choosing a career, but identifying what your purpose is. And I think that's, you know, the route that we'll take. And when we go back to talking about um, this as a strategy to do something different than what's currently going on, um, a lot of times uh, students are not taught to think. And so, you know, you have that thing where there are schools that do a lot of project-based learning and things of that nature. And so just, you know, getting our students to, to see that there are many ways to learn, that means that, you know, by going out on trips and like I said, the project-based things, but really getting them to key in on what it, not just what you like to do, but what could you see yourself contributing to society? Because they, they do have other research out there that says that when people are surveyed about their college degrees, most people are not, do not wind up doing that for a lifetime. They wind up doing something they say they quote unquote like doing. And so there has to be a way to merge in because I believe that you do have to be skilled at something. So I'm not throwing out, don't go to college, but finding a way to bridge for our students, finding the things that you like to do with those things that you can contribute to solve a problem. What bothers you about your community? You know, getting them to identify those things. And of course, making everything culturally relevant. I love it. I love it. So with so many things coming at you um, with education, the trends, how do you stay abreast of everything that comes? Because we have to stay current. <laughs> yes, we do. There's nothing worse than somebody talking about something they don't really know. <laughs> and so um, I do read a lot. I am a research buff, um, educational journals. I like to participate in blogs, especially with people that have differences of opinion. Um, I think that that's healthy. And I, I love it when somebody says, you know what, you opened up my eyes to another way of thinking about things. And I think that those things are healthy because then there's sometimes when people do that for me. But I think I would never have that experience if I stayed in my own little world. Even when you think that you have something good, I think it's good to interact with people that have differences of opinion because that makes everything a little bit better. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. So as you know, many states have waived the standardized testing during the spring of 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. And right now it's up in the air for many school districts about 2021. Um, do you think this will lead to states perhaps finding alternatives to standardized testing? And then what is your position on standardized testing? And I think I'll start with the second part of that question. Um, because that's one that's kind of a burning thing. Um, I think standardized tests sell our students short and not just black students, but students in America, period. Because if you look at this, the data, white students, you know, they talk about the black white achievement gap or the white uh, Asian gap or whatever they want to talk about. But the white students overall are not doing well compared to other countries. Well, like I said, when you talk about us being 38th in math, you know, and then even more so with us. So um, standardized tests, it's like they have this standard and this thing that's set you know, for proficiency, but they don't offer teachers the support and the resources to get there. It's like the school reform. They would identify all these things that need to be done differently, but then they don't give you the support to get there. If Johnny's in the third grade and he needs to be proficient at third grade, but he came in barely knowing letters and sounds, somebody has to spend some time with him an interventionist, 
somebody, a speech, somebody, somebody got to find out what's going on with Johnny and why he's so far behind. And if you don't, if you have a third grade teacher that's got 38 kids in the classroom, nobody to assist him or her, there's no way they can address those needs. And I know of some states like Michigan, um, thank God for, this is one of the positive things in um, our state. When the pandemic came, they threw, they didn't, they stopped this thing called the third grade reading law. This was gonna be the first year, last school year, where if a student was not reading on third grade level, they could not be promoted to fourth grade, which I thought was very radically um, unnecessary and unfair. And the good thing is our governor, she came in after it was passed and she was trying to get it reversed. So I applaud her for that. But you can't demand that somebody read on a third grade level if they're at a kindergarten level and not give the resources. And what a, and it's, it's like these reform efforts, a lot of times they come back and they keep penalizing. And that's what I see a lot of the standardized tests doing. They're penalizing students for what they don't know rather than giving them support to get to that level. And so what I do think is I think that some states will develop alternatives depending upon how long this pandemic goes. And I think that, you know, my hope is that they will look and see for some, some more innovative ways to assess student performance. Because if everybody's not doing well, because we're not compared to other countries, everybody's not doing well and we keep not doing well. And even though the, the black white student gap has probably decreased a little bit, we're still far behind them, but nobody should be behind. And you know, no, no child left behind, it made me think of that. Um, but nobody should be left behind, but we're not doing anything differently really when it comes to the allocation of resources and stuff. We're doing the same thing. We're requiring schools to kind of figure it out. And if you don't make the grade, you know, the whole threat of, you know, taking out the leadership, you know, redoing this and making you a priority school and all this stuff. It's like this cycle of stuff that doesn't work. And so my prayer is that um, states will take a different look at it. And I think those people who are innovators, um, they're probably going to push for that. And I think that this is the time to kind of, if it's gonna get pushed through at any time, this is a good time because they're not doing standardized tests, so to speak right now. And so this is a good time if somebody has a team of people that um, are on that innovative track to submit some things. And I think this is a time where educators can kind of shine because we know a lot of these policymakers that come up with these things, they're not educators. And that's another thing. Uh, sometimes they have educators on the boards and things of that, major, um, of that nature, but a lot of times we're not in the decision-making room and that's a problem. Absolutely, you know, and I, and I have to say that it also, um, with pacing, um, the standardized yes. testing, because we're so driven to get through the curriculum and we don't take the time to allow students to catch up, to learn. No. Um, but, you know, it's like our hands are tied. You know, you're trying to get through the curriculum so that you can get everything in to yes. meet that standardized test. <laughs> right. <laughs> but then the students don't get it. So, you know, it, it, it's definitely time to look at other ways to assess. Definitely. I agree. Totally. Absolutely. So ESSA, the Every Student Succeed Act, we know that was signed into law December 2015 by President Obama. And it yes. basically is in existence to expand opportunities uh, for all students for equity, access, and inclusion. Basically what you were saying is needed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we know that, um, you know, it varies in PK-12 education, but as a former yes. principal, how did you ensure that your students, the students that you serve, and even um, with your academy, um, that there mm -hmm. is equity, access, and inclusion for those students? Yes, that's a very good question. And one of the things, and when I first came into the situation as principal, I had to take time to, of course, act, act, assess where the students were in terms of the data and seeing where the deficits were. And I had to do the same thing with staff to assess where their strengths were and where some of their challenges were so that I could give them the appropriate support. Um, if students are continually not passing writing portions of tests, and I, that means I need to examine how is writing being taught. And so if I assess that, you know, writing is not being taught in a manner where it makes sense, where it's meeting the kids at the point of their need, and then we have to make some adjustments. But the, the big answer is that, you know, I have to, as they say, inspect what I expect. 
So if teachers are the main fa factors in terms of student um, achievement, I have to make sure that the teachers are supported in a way that they are making meaningful decisions in terms of their strategies. Because unfortunately, I don't think standardized tests are gonna go away unless somebody on the level of a secretary of education comes in with the passion that we have that you know there has to be something different and we have to look at ways of assessing students outside of standardized tests because i don't believe and this is something that i haven't looked into i don't think a lot of these other countries have all this testing i know some of my preliminary research says that they don't do a lot of this testing um i know there's one country i was looking at where they don't even test kids in terms of the content that they've been studying until like months into the school year. It's like they give them time to explore and to really digest information and to really process it and to engage with their colleagues and their classmates in the material. And it produces phenomenal results. And so, you know, that, that's my thinking on that. Thank you. You're welcome. So I truly believe that failure is a part of the success journey. I just believe yes. it. Um, what has been some of your biggest failures and what did you learn from them? Um, one has been, I think, um, entrusting too much to leadership in terms of their guidance. Um, I've been in situations where people did not provide the support that I needed, but expected me to achieve on a certain level. And so what it taught me was that I need to learn what they expect. And I may not understand that I may not get it there. I may have to team up with somebody else in another building or somewhere else that's doing the same thing that I need. Um, also, there was one time I had gotten this big promotion and um, I was like, okay, new kid on the block. I need to impress this supervisor and make sure that I'm doing everything. If it requires extra hours, fine. I had two small children at the time, but I'm like, I'm thinking the school day ends at three. There may be many days I'm there to five maybe six, but that shouldn't be every day. And, um, but I was in the school where we were there to almost eight o'clock every day in meetings, not working on projects, getting testing materials together, just in a sitting in his office in a meeting. And it was so unproductive. And the, the Renee today, looking back, I would have addressed that and asked for respectfully that, you know, my family comes first, my kids, they would be passed out on the benches in the office. Um, had had dinner, just eating snacks, you know, and then by the time we get home, homework's out the window, dinner, all that. And so just that, but it taught me, you know, and it informed my decision as a school leader that you don't do that to people. Just never forgetting how that made me feel. It's like, oh, it was the worst thing. And so it informed my leadership role where I knew that I would never do that to staff. And it goes into simple things like, why are you having meetings every week? That's not always necessary. There's another create, I'm being after school because we know what happens after school. We're all beat down. And I saw creative things happening in my children's schools where there was one school district that we belonged to where the staff would come in in the mornings once a week. And the teachers rather do that. They would come in like an hour before school started and some kind of way they would have a delayed start or whatever would happen, but um, it worked. And it's like finding those things, you know, it informed me to work with your staff to find out things that would work for them because you have to engage them in the process because they are the wheels on the bus. And we're not going anywhere. As they say, if mama ain't happy, <laughs> ain't nobody happy. Oh no, there's, I love this book. I refer to it often. It says, um, if you don't feed the teachers, they'll eat the kids, basically the students. Absolutely. And that is something that I, I take to heart that, you know, and you have to be genuine about it. You know, just being genuine, having those genuine conversations. You know, in your response, you touched on something that um, I think educators are now finally getting a grip of, but that work-life balance is a yes. real thing. And we oftentimes as educators have neglected our families and their academics when, you know, yep. as you said. And so I'm glad that you touched on that because um, you do hear now, that, you know, we are more in tuned and leaders are now encouraging teachers, you know, and doing those things that even principals, you know, do the same things, yes. work eight hours, 
have a family. And so talk to me a little bit about you realizing that, because as you said, the Renee today, yes, <laughs> things very differently than, you know, you had to do those few years when you were in the building. So talk a little bit about the importance of that work-life balance specifically for educators. Most definitely. We have a very unique, um, I would say work lifestyle. Um, we take a lot of it home because, you know, as a teacher, part of your job is grading papers and you don't have a lot of time during the day to do that. And so when you leave your job, you go home and whether you're single or married, you have another mode of being that you're in, mindset and actions. And so you have to find ways to kind of, as much as possible, leave work at work. And sometimes it's easier said than done. And there are situations where sometimes you have to stay later or go to work er earlier. And I think that that's the thing you have to address personally, what works for you. Are you a come to work an hour early, stay work an hour late, but you have to limit, you have to set some limitations mm -hmm. because if you are that person staying in the building to eight and nine, and I knew those type of people, mm -hmm. teachers, and it's like, there is not that much pressing that you should be here to eight and nine o'clock. You know, if school starts at, at eight and you wanna come at six because you can, this is your piece, the place of peace, and you can kind of listen to your music and look at your lesson plans. I get that. But really finding that balance for yourself, because what happens? We get burnt out. We get burnt out at the end of the day. And so, yes, I, I learned early yes. that, you know, there has to be balance because you see the memes on, on uh, social media all the time. If you were to die today, somebody would be in your position tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, what's the priority? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yes. And so my passion, my research is all about aspiring school leaders. And so yes. what advice would you give to an aspiring school leader? Excellent. Excellent. I would tell them um, to make sure that you are in the process of mastering how to build relationships, because that's what it's all about. Um, when you have a vision whatever capacity that you serve in a principal, assistant principal, a department head, um, you have to work with people. And so you have to be skilled at um, building relationships, which includes empowering others, not thinking not you don't want them to be dependent upon you that, you know, she doesn't tell us, we don't know which way to go. I should be able to give you something. And, and by the time that, you know, I walk away, you feel like, oh, we can do this. And you know that if you have a question or there's something that you don't think you can, you're not understanding, you can come back. But empowering, you know, building relationships and empowering people. And also make sure that if you don't already um, de have developed it, to make sure you're maintaining a growth mindset. And that comes to the, the constant process of, you know, the cycle of school improvement, of assessing data, you know, and making adjustments and implementing change. And just always having that in the back of your mind that this is all about um, improvement and the growth mi mindset. And of course, as we talked about self-care, have a system of self-care, have, you know, the, the setting those boundaries professionally, um, time frame, because you, we find and we know that the more people um, ask you, the more that you will do. Mm -hmm. Usually leaders are that way. They, you know, we're. We're just, you know, we're in the throes of it. And it's like, we want to get it done. And so whatever it takes. And sometimes what it takes is me coming back tomorrow with a fresh set of eyes mm -hmm. <laughs> and, right. and a clear head. Exactly. And so, yeah, that balance is so important. Exactly. And so, you know, I'm very interested. Were you always, um, did you always know you were going to be an educator? When, when did that come to you? No. Um, when I went to undergrad, my major was public affairs. Wow. And it's crazy because um, at Lincoln University, upperclassmen were tell telling all the freshmen, no matter what your major is going to be, you have to take intro to education. I was like, why would I do that? They was like, no, Dr. Thomas, it will change your life. They was like, you know, they said everybody takes that class. And so I took the class and, and, and on the inside, I would be like this. Like, wow. And it really changed my life. And so it was like, I want to do this. I want to impact the future of children. I want them to know it's like there was something like, you know, and I've always wanted people that look like me to succeed. I felt like I had a gift for encouraging and motivating and empowering people that look like me. 
And I think because I've always been successful with um, engaging students in the learning process, that has always been something that was like, you know, it gets me fired up. Thank you. Yeah. So what skills have helped you become where you are successful in, in, in your career? Yes, um, I would say at the basic level, people skills. Mm -hmm. um, I think because as you move into a leadership role, how many times, whether you're at a fast food restaurant or you know, a coach of a team um, and you see people in these leadership positions and you like, they seem like they don't even like people. How did they get that position and why would they want it? You don't even seem like you like people. And so I think um, being a people person, someone that people can trust, being honest, following through um, for people to know that, you know, if you ask her something, she's going to be attentive to it. She's going to listen. She's not going to pacify you, be condescending. And then going into a leadership position because you come through as a teacher, um, they understand that, you know, the same route that they're, they're taking. You understand the challenges and the day-to-day -day challenge of being that classroom teacher. And so having had that experience gives you an edge up. And most of the time, um, they can, they can expect that you're going to do this because I understand what type of load this is going to take off you or whatever. Everything from I need some more pencils to, you know, I need a printer in my room, whatever it is. If, you know, teachers, they, they take that stuff like gold when you are attentive to it, it's like, oh, I feel supported. And that's a big thing. Feeling, you know, giving that support, I think, has been a big thing because when you were talking about making change and improving student achievement, you have to be able to rally the troops. And if you're not a people person, and if you can't make sense of that data and make it so that the teachers see where it's something that they can do, um, you've lost half of the battle. And wow. so um, I think that's a big credit to me. Yes. And so you've made many references to Lincoln, to the intro, to education, um, the professor there. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about the impact of attending an HBCU. How has that impacted you professionally? It has been everything. Um, and to go through and get my master's and my doctorate, it's like none of them compare to the foundation that I got at an HBCU. I never forget one time I failed a course in um, English with Dr. Willis and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go talk to her and you know, she gonna understand my struggle. And, you know, and I remember going into the office and I'm telling her, I said, you know, can I please get at least a D? I said, I'll do whatever I can to do makeup. And um, she was a very, um, you know, she had the glasses very prude from the outside and you would think that you better not say nothing to her. And so she looked at me across that desk. She said, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna take the class again and you're gonna pass it the next time. And that's all she said. But what that did for me is let me know first early on, um, don't be out here looking for the hookup. You gotta go through the process and there's pain involved in that process but it was a life lesson wow. and I could only have gotten it by wow. going that route. And I'm so glad that she took that stance um, because I didn't need to get out of it mm -hmm. because I was being lazy mm -hmm. and I wasn't being attentive in my class and mm -hmm. following through with assignments. And so I, why did I expect her to rescue me at the end? Wow. And so, um, you know, with her and Dr. Thomas, it's like the standard of excellence, mm -hmm. but it was an excellence from a point of view that we've been where you're going. Right. And so we're giving you some inside information. It's like, you've got to be good at what you do. Wow. You've got to be excellent <laughs> at what you do. And they would say it just like that. There is no shortcut. Mm. There's no shortcut. You're going to be, and my mom, you know, she would say, you know, she worked for IBM all my life. And she would tell stories in, from a young age. I remember her, I was probably around seven or eight. And um, she would talk about being unfairly um, evaluations and stuff and how she had to have tons and tons of documentation for them to evaluate her fairly. And I remember this one day she said, um, I remember, and she said, never forget what Dr. King said, excellence is a deterrent to racism. Wow. And she said, but you got to be able, and she was very big on communication. I never forget that from the young age on up, you got to communicate You're written and orally. You got to be able to speak your mind clearly and you got to cover your behind. You mm. got to have, and she would say, you know, I've got piles and piles of documentation where they tried to say I wasn't something. And so those types of things, you know, 
with the black experience. Um, but yeah, that HBCU experience. And so I think when I, you know, growing up in Syracuse, predominantly white coming to Detroit, um, I wanted the students that I had to, to get that same type of experience. Yeah. That was one of my goals, that I want them to understand that there's a world outside of Detroit. Everywhere you go, you go is not going to be predominantly Black. Mm -hmm. uh, I had experienced racism growing up, being called nigger by white kids and all that kind of stuff. I said, you all may never have that experience unless you go out into the real world, but you got to know how to be able to handle it. Yes. And so I think the HBCU experience, it gave me a well-rounded picture um, of what it takes to be prepared. Like I said, that foundation so that I saw where when I came to Detroit, I would see other teachers that went through teacher programs. And I was thinking to myself, what in the world were they taught? Wow. It's like there was stuff that we took for granted mm. that we were taught to do in terms of classroom management and unlocking the untapped potential. Wow. And just, but it, it, again, it came from a perspective of somebody saying, you know, wanting you to excel and, and equipping you with those skills instead of taking you at face value based on your behavior. Wow. That's and so I think that that's an experience that we all benefit from. Absolutely. And it's nothing like that HBCU experience. Nothing. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you most proud of in your career? I think it's those moments when um, you see those students, whether they're having a hard time or they're underachieving and you see that they're, they're getting it um, or in the same with staff. Um, I never forget there was an older teacher and um, he was kind of struggling with using technology, but I had a heart to heart and I said, you know, the kids are misbehaving and they're um, falling asleep. I said, would you consider using the smart board in your classroom and all that kind of stuff? He said, well, you know, I would, I, I think about it. And da, da, da. I said, well, let me know when you're going to use it. And if you need some support, I'll have the IT person come in and, and assist you or whatever, whatever. And never said anything about it. And one day, you know, he would always be there extra early anyway. Um, good guy, had a long standing career in education, just had some challenges with this new way of, you know, this new generation. And I'll never forget, I was walking to my office and I, he must have seen me walk by. He came out and he said, Dr. Morehead, now come back, I wanna show you something. And lo and behold, he had his laptop hooked up to the smart board and he was showing me all the websites he was gonna use that day and how he had gotten another colleague to help him with something. Wow. something. And so that was one of those moments. Yes. And it's the same way, even teaching in high school where you have those students who put on the front as though you know, they're tougher than you and you have to maintain your ground and you wonder, oh, this might be a tough cookie to crack. And then when they have that moment where they thank you for being that way. And years later, like I'm on Facebook with a lot of my former students and many times they'll inbox me or they'll say on my page, you know, thank you for being this way. And this really helped me. I run into them at stores and I had a girl tell me how I gave her a D on her final project. And I told her that um, the only reason I would have done that is because you had probably plagiarized and she laughed. And I said, I was probably supposed to give you an F. And I said, cause I don't, D's mean that you probably didn't do anything. I said, but for your final project, it's probably because you had some plagiarism in there or something. <laughs> I didn't want to fail you. And she laughed and she said, you're right. She said, I was mad. She said, oh, that is. <laughs> and so, but it's having those moments when you see that, when you see the students turn around, when you see them start believing in themselves. Absolutely. Um, I've had students, I say, oh, you're smart. And they say, no, I'm not. And I said, oh, yes, you are. And I'm not going to accept anything less. But between the students showing improvement and staff really embracing um, their potential, and being willing to make those changes on behalf of, behalf of students, those are the proudest moments. Wow, unbelievable. I love it. Thank you. Yes. So let's talk about goal setting because you've accomplished so much. I mean, you've held so Thank many you. positions out in public and private and charter schools. You now founded your own school, Academy of Learning, and yes. you now have your own business. How do you set your steps to reach your goals? What do you do in order to attain the things that you want? Yeah, and I believe in a very simple system. Um, I believe what the Bible says about writing a vision and making it plain. And so I go through a process of just writing down my thoughts, the brainstorming process. Um, you know, this is what I envision. Um, and then if it 
it's like a personal goal. That's something that I'm going to be working on myself, but always putting that time frame on it. You know, they have this thing called the SMART goals where you have these different parts of your goal setting. Mine is real simple. It's like, you know, establish the vision. And if it involves um, the need for other people, like developing the schools, um, there's so many pieces to it. And it involves me um, having consultants, um, even though there are things that I can do because there's so many things to do, I don't have to have my hand in everything. And so engaging the expertise of others as needed. So you set the goal, engage others in the shared vision, and you start that action plan and you start working at those things, but it's based on a time frame. And I find that, you know, they say a dream without um, timelines is just that, it's just a dream. And so we wanna achieve our goals. And that's been very helpful for me, just following that simple process, write the vision down. And that's a, is a big step for a lot of people. In my consulting business, when I do personal coaching or executive coaching, People will tell me things and I was like, oh, okay, well, can you send me <laughs> what right. you're saying? And it's like, oh, well, you have to give me a few days. And it's like, okay, but that's the biggest part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to write that vision down and set some actionable goals with time frames. Thank you. So what oh, and, oh, and another got, big part, I'm sorry, is <laughs> celebrating your small victories. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, when I, you know, going through the, the doctorate uh, dissertation process, <laughs> it's like um, my favorite candy bar is a Reese cup. And when I would finish a chapter or something, I might just, oh, I'm going to get me a Reese cup today. Or just, <laughs> just something that was a little sign to me yes. to say, yay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what's next for Dr. Renee L. Morehand? Well, getting these schools up and running is my priority one. one. Uh, right now in the process of writing um, grants and working on funding to get uh, this charter school application process going in both states, which is a monster, but it's achievable. Um, and so that's the biggest thing right now, just getting the, the schools up and running. Awesome. I love it. And um, you talked a little bit about presenting your work at the doctoral, uh, the Black Doctoral Network. How has the affiliation of the network enhanced your career? It has been awesome. You know, I would say it's twofold. Um, number one, of course, providing a platform for me to share my work uh, and my research. I was able to share the work that I did for my dissertation at a regional conference in LA um, one year and um, just some of the other work that I'm then doing that impacts the community. But then also it has provided me this networking with people that are like-minded that is priceless. My current mentor, I met her at a BDN conference She's um, a retired school leader that ran an Afrocentric charter school in the DC area for over 15 years. And, you know, so I credit the BDN Network Conference for um, creating that connection for me. If I hadn't met her, who knows how long it may have been before I got that because we know mentorship is a key part Absolutely. of being successful. Absolutely. I applaud you. I, I really do. This thank you. has been just a pleasure. Uh, I thank you for joining um, us today. Thank you. You are so welcome. Yes, it's been amazing. Um, if you will, please just tell our viewers and listeners where they can connect and where they can learn more about you and the work that you're doing. Awesome. Um, my website um, is E, the letters E Y V today, T O D A Y, for expanding your vision eyvtoday.com and then when it comes to Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, I'm Dr. period dr period Renee is in r e n e e i s i n Dr. period Renee is in I love it. I love it. Please be sure to stay connected to the Black Doctoral Network and connect with us on all of our social media platforms. Thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, and we hope you will join us again next time. But for now, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and tell a friend.